Well, thank you so much, Heather, and thank you everybody for having us here. We're thrilled to be here and uh, share with you about uh, some of our explorations around uh, some of the inland, inland uh, areas that, that might be of interest. Uh, we realize that uh, this may not be for everybody, um, but hopefully this will do one of two things. Either it will inspire you and maybe on your way down to San Francisco or, or Mexico or somewhere else, you uh, plan a little bit of diversion and actually go to some of these places. And if that does not sound appealing for whatever reason, doesn't fit your schedule, doesn't fit where your cruising grounds are, maybe our presentation will help you be inspired to explore some of the some of the more unusual or unknown local areas that might be uh, wherever you're cruising. So um, let's talk a little bit about who we are. Um, so we started off, we're actually probably, uh, as, as we were talking to Heather, uh, we probably have some of the least experience in this, in this group. And it's amazing to uh, listen to everybody about what you're doing, how you're preparing and everything else. Um, We've, uh, we've been sailing on other people's boats for, for quite some time. We've uh, chartered in Europe, in uh, Thailand, uh, sailed on inland lakes. Uh, we're actually, our, our land home, as we call it, is uh, we're based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so nowhere particularly near, uh, and certainly not an ocean, but plenty of lakes. Um, so we've, uh, we've raced on a local uh, club, sailing club in Dallas. Uh, quite a bit, so the, lots of great experience on uh, on a small dinghy, um, and then uh, Amazing Grace, our our boat is uh, our first keel boat, and uh, we were particularly fascinated with uh, with the boat, and um, oops, uh, we were particularly uh, interested in in uh, in this boat and. Uh, Adrian's famous uh, quote was, well, if we just find one of these boats in North America because they're British made, we should just buy it. Well, that one just came on the market about six months after she said that and happened to be in Portland, Oregon. So that's where we're based out of when we're on our, uh, in our water home, or as we call it, cottage on the water. And uh, over the last two and a half, almost three years that we've owned this boat, we've spent nearly 300 days uh, aboard overnighting and exploring. So that is kind of our experience and, and uh, uh, what, we've, what we've done that we would love to share with you. And uh, she might make an appearance on, on Adrian's screen, but uh, yeah. I'll let you introduce her. I think, um, I think she's recognizing her name's about to be said because I hear her over there. So this is our crew member, Karina. Um, she was an indoor only cat for the first 11 years of her life. And about two years ago, um, we decided that if we're going to be living aboard as much as we are, she is going to have to come with us. So she is now known as the adventure kitty. Um, she took to it right away. If anyone, um, has questions about cats on board, um, we always love to talk about her. She has her own page on our website now, and she's blogging on her own. Um, she is also known as the Admiral um, because it is very clear that she is in charge. Um, she has claimed the ship. She has claimed the captain's seat. Um, we have an indoor helm on the boat, and that seems to always be where she wants to supervise us and keep an eye on things. Um, and sometimes when she um, just gets tired, she just stretches out and gets comfortable. So um, you might see an occasional appearance of Miss Karina through this presentation, but we wanted to make sure and introduce introduce the crew. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, what we think is an amazing boat. Um, it's a thirty seven foot uh, Southerly one fifteen uh, built in nineteen eighty seven. Uh, and one of the unique features and part of what uh, was very fascinating to us why we were pursuing this particular boat or even uh, most southerlies have a swing keel uh, was uh, the fact that we can go from a six foot eight inch draft to a two foot six inches. So we can, um, on our boat, it's a, it's a hydraulic manual keel that, uh, that we have to pump up. Um, but it definitely uh, gives us a lot more flexibility, especially uh, when we're exploring some of the uncharted waters. Um, and uh, specific to this presentation, I want to make sure and point out that uh, while we realize that uh, most people don't have that uh, luxury or feature on their boat, 
Um, everything we're going to talk about is is perfectly available to everybody uh, with a keel. Even if you have an eight foot keel, uh, this is all very much uh, available to you. Uh, the, uh, the the limiting factor to some extent uh, further upstream uh, might be the air draft. So depending on your on your mast height, in our case, that's 52 feet one inch. Uh, we've got a 39 horsepower Yanmar, uh, just a three cylinder, uh, nice trusty diesel that pushes us along. Um, we probably motor at six, six and a half, maybe seven knots if we really push it, which is going to uh, be relevant when we're going to talk about some of the currents, especially underneath the dams. Um, we, as part of the preparation for this trip, we kind of rewired and added to our uh, power house bank so that we could be off the grid and not be dependent. Um, again, some areas have way more availability for shore power than others. Uh, so we also have uh, some solar that uh, can recharge us and, um, and keep us running. So uh, the swing keel, again, this picture, a lot of times people see it and we've had, we had a lot of people run up to kind of from the shore and try to ensure that we were okay. Uh, as we say in the software industry, this is a feature, not a bug. Um, the boat is designed to be able to ground itself, so it's a great way to uh, get down and, uh, um, you know, check the through holes or uh, grease or uh, grease or folding prop or anything like that. But uh, again, because these boats are made in the UK, where the tidal differences are much, much larger, they're made to be actually grounded. Um, we've... Um, We've taken advantage of it a couple of times. And uh, again, more, more or less, the, the real swing keel part is uh, the advantage of being able to get into some skinny water or in, in some of the sand or mud banks to be able to pull up the keel and, uh, and then continue on or back up and retrace some of our, some of our steps. Uh, just before you continue, Peter, we've yep. had a question about the rudder. You know, what's the draft on that and how does that work with you uh, getting good and shallow like that? Yeah, uh, the rudder is designed in such a way. So it's got kind of a protected skeg uh, vertically, but also also horizontally. So when the boat sits, um, the keel, um, there's, I can get very technical about it, but I, I, I'll, I'll try to keep it straightforward. Um, on the boat itself, um, the, the um, the rudder and everything else is on one plane. So the, the keel retracts into a um, bracket on which the boat sits. So it's a, it's a cast iron bracket, if you will, that's part of the, the keel structure. So the keel retracts and the boat sits on this rectangular piece and the rudder is shallow enough uh, and is designed exactly to be able to um, be grounded or be, be um, dried out like this. So, um, stats and route. Yeah, stats and route. So, Lewiston is the furthest inland seaport um, in North America. So it is a well. I won't. I won't try and do the math right here from the thing. But um, it's basically three rivers, four hundred ninety-one miles total. So three hundred twenty-five miles on the Columbia. You can take an offshoot um, headed south, which is upstream on the Willamette. That's an extra 26 miles. That is not necessary to get into Idaho, but that is just an interesting other things to see downtown Portland. Um, and then when you get to the um, top of the navigable of the Columbia, it's another 140 miles on the snake. So along the way, you hit 50 bridges. Um, of those 50 bridges, um, on the Columbia, nine are opening, on the Willamette, three, and on the Snake, three, and the rest of them are fixed bridges. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about bridges later in the presentation, but the lowest of the bridges at full open height is 51 feet, eight inches. If you remember when Peter was talking, ours is 51 feet, two inches is our air draft. So there were a few nervous moments when that six inches came into play. Um, but yeah, that is the, um, the navigable distance you can go. There are eight dams and locks along the way. Four of those um, dams are on the Columbia River and four of them are on the Snake River. We're gonna talk a lot more about the process of locking through and those um, lock locations. But the elevation change of those locks, if you add them up cumulatively, is nine times 
the um, height of the Panama Canal. It's a total of 738 feet. So quite a bit of elevation gain as you're going inland towards Idaho. The whole trip is really retracing the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, if you happen to be a historian or someone who enjoys um, just hearing stories about um, America and kind of how we all got here, um, where you see the red star there is as far as you can get in by boat, um, but it is following exactly the path of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, and all along the way, you will find monuments, historical plaques, um, remembrances of what happened on each step along the way. So we just found that to be a really cool addition. We um, were a little surprised by how much is documented up and down the river um, and how many places you can, you know, read up on it and look at all of the different historical artifacts along the way. Um, we're going to pull up map. So the first line is um, the Columbia River there with a little hop down on the Willamette. Um, and then up past Kennewick on the Columbia, and then along um, the Snake River, just south of the Kennewick extension up of the Columbia. We are going to talk about lots of places as we go through this presentation. Um, when you see the map and the little stars, we're just going to follow along and bring up some places that we found particularly of interest um, and hope you, um, hope you do too. Speaking of some of the favorite places, um, so we'll uh, we'll make this presentation kind of a combination of both. We'll talk about some of the technical things, everything from the dams and bridges and weather, et cetera. And uh, we'll also uh, very much talk about uh, some of the favorite stops and destinations. Um, again, there is way more to see out there than uh, than what we're um, than we're going to talk about. Uh, but we're just going to share some of our favorite stops. Uh, one of the first things you're going to have to do as you cross the Columbia Bar is to decide, um, are you more of the wine drinker or are you more of the beer drinker? Because this area is unique in, uh, in the aspect that uh, you have both uh, some really, really good breweries and some many, many different wineries. So, uh, and if you enjoy both, um, probably advisable when out and about is to decide, okay, and Adrian and I have it to do that on a number of occasions where we say, okay, is this a uh, wine night or is this a beer night? Um, because a lot of times uh, the tasting rooms and breweries and wine, uh, wine cellars are very much next to each other or on the same street. So um, those are places you can go, you can visit the vineyards, you can visit the breweries and uh, uh, really enjoy everything the area has to offer. And um, I'm gonna try to see why my screen is, um, it's got scratches on it, but, um, well. What's it doing? I don't know, I see a, something on the screen here, artifact, maybe, maybe it's not shared, I don't know. All right, yeah, anyway. it's shared, I don't know what it is. But the breweries all have pizza, not all of them but a lot of them. So if you like, if you like homemade gourmet pizzas, you can get a lot of those too. So um, Ilwaco, when you first cross the Columbia Bar, uh, most people don't notice that Ilwaco is there on the north side, uh, pretty much just as you enter um, onto the Columbia River. Um, everyone stops in Astoria, which we'll talk about also. Um, Ilwaco is this quaint little fishing village um, that is super quiet and um, lots of hiking trails. But one thing we particularly liked about it is you can hike out to the lighthouses that are out facing the Pacific Ocean. And um, there's two of them there on the peninsula and just really beautiful, misty, cool, historic feeling town. Um, so highly recommend that. And then Astoria is the place where most people stop to stage before leaving the Columbia River. Um, but truly more than just a staging city, it's a great town in its own right. Um, one thing that I would love to point out there is that they've got the Columbia River Maritime Museum there. Um, and if you have any interest in learning more about the Columbia River Bar, the Bar Pilots, and just the history of how it um, became known as the Graveyard of the Pacific and just the, the history of what goes on back and forth on the bar, that museum is fantastic and definitely worth a stop. 
So let's talk a little bit about the conditions that you might encounter here. Uh, there's a lot of prevailing winds, uh, even though, as you see from the map, it kind of twists and turns and sometimes heads uh, north or south. Uh, the, the prevailing direction is obviously east and west. And uh, regardless of what the local forecast will say, uh, the winds are generally going to follow uh, the, the river. So sometimes, uh, unless you really want to be motoring, um, it's, it's advisable just to wait uh, until, until the next change because uh, if you're, especially if you're sailing, um, the, the wind's going to come uh, from behind sooner rather than later. Um, better or worse, you're not going to do much beam, beam reach sailing here. Uh, the one thing that the, you should be aware of if you decide to adventure out here is wind against current. And um, that is a very, very pronounced here, depending on the area, depending on the, on the portion. Uh, but if the wind is blowing out of the west, which is pushing you nicely upwind, uh, there are definitely some areas where that wind against current uh, really stacks up. Um, the current, uh, there are some areas where it barely runs. Uh, and then there are areas, especially as I mentioned earlier, is underneath the dams where the current can be six knots or even higher. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the dams and kind of how to navigate uh, the approaches and everything else about those. But uh, especially in the springtime, uh, when they're releasing some of the snow melt and, and everything else, uh, the, the water flow is going to be definitely increased. There was one particular day we were on a segment where we've been there before and it just seemed that I kept checking the engine. I kept uh, looking at the charts. I can, you know, you know, doing my little thing and tapping on the, on the speedo and, and making sure our speed was correct, but it just wasn't adding up. I was, I kept missing about a knot, knot and a half of speed uh, as we were trying to motor. And then uh, when we arrived in the evening, somebody at the dock there said, oh, yeah, the dam has been because uh, it was middle of the summer and a lot of people were running their air conditioning. And because of hydropower, they were uh, needing to produce more electricity. Therefore, they were releasing more water. Uh, but we didn't know that uh, until later on where we learned about putting together and, and researching the just like you check the weather, we would check the, the water release schedules uh, and learn that that does make uh, quite a substantial difference. Um, the other good news here, though, is that the there is a channel. There is a shipping channel for ocean-going ships to go all the way up to Portland. Uh, so that's uh, over 100 miles inland. And uh, further all the way to Idaho, there is commercial traffic going there. Um, you'll encounter everything from uh, freighters, uh, bulk freighters, um, anything you can imagine on the ocean, and you will be in very close proximity to them. Um, so especially on the lower Columbia, this is, uh, this is quite an experience when a giant rotor like this shows up uh, right around the corner next to you. Um, AIS, um, very helpful to see what's around the corner. Uh, VHF communication, uh, also very helpful. And uh, definitely be aware there's uh, plenty of times, uh, not that we've experienced it that often, but uh, there's plenty of times where these ships have to do their um, five signals uh, to get the fishing boats out of the way in particular, because those people don't listen to any, any VHF or anything else, and they just want to be right there on the, on the edge of the channel. But the good news about all of this is uh, no matter what you encounter, even some Navy vessels, um, there is a very well-defined and well-charted channel uh, in all of these rivers. So regardless of uh, what your immediate draft might be, um, this is, again, available, dredged frequently, and well-charted. Uh, some of the things, um, we talked about Raspberry Pi, there was an announcement, so we've used OpenCPN, we use CIQ, US Coast Guard has free charts available for all of these areas, and again, they're, they're well-charted and well-documented. On the, beyond Portland, uh, what you'll encounter and what you'll see most is a lot of barges. Uh, now, these barges, uh, they're uh, they're, they're quite big. They can be double wide and double long, and uh, they don't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of maneuvering space, especially the further up you go where the channel can be quite narrow. Um, on the lower Columbia, they might uh, have some space to obviously turn around and maneuver, but uh, there are definitely places on, uh, on the upstream side of things where uh, they're very restricted in their maneuverability, and they're big. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, how big they are and how they're designed to fit exactly into, into the locks. So 
the other uh, conditions that you will encounter besides the weather is, um, especially around Hood River, and there is a lot of places uh, where, again, microclimate and local winds are a giant incentive for other water sports. Um, what you're seeing on this video is just a fraction of what was uh, all around us that day. And uh, we were quite worried uh, of, you know, all of our uh, weight plowing down the, the river. And these people are coming sometimes a little bit too close for comfort. And I just told Adrian, I said, you know what, if somebody falls right next to us, we just got to, you know, keep our, uh, keep our faith that they'll uh, figure out how to get out of our way. And if not, just uh, throw them a scrub and maybe they'll, uh, they'll get our water line. But um, there, is a, there is a lot of places, uh, if you see this, this is another kind of a good clue is uh, we've learned over time is that when you see these uh, kite surfers, wind surfers, et cetera, the winds are probably blowing well over 15. They don't even show up when the winds are under 15. So we've been in places where we're out, you know, full rig, everything else, barely making any, any headway uh, because winds are, let's say between five and eight, and then we'll see half a mile or a mile down the road, uh, a lot of kite surfers. That's, uh, we've learned, kind of the hard way that that's our signal to, okay, we might want to reef or prepare for some changing conditions. Because as soon as this, um, you know, we might come around a corner or something that little microclimate will shift and uh, provide a little bit of a surprise. So better to be prepared, especially because again, that wind and the current, that interplay there is, uh, is quite impactful. So for us, I'm kind of a geek planner, whatever you want to call it. And so we've uh, created a spreadsheet with everything along the way. Uh, and we are uh, we put the website up front and we'll have it at the end of the presentation as well. We're now transcribing this uh, based on several requests we've had into our website to where we're going to have kind of the guide and everything transcribed. We're not selling anything. We're not asking um, for, for anything. This is just, it took a lot of research, honestly. and for us, big part of the, the journey is doing the research and kind of figuring out where we're going. Um, and uh, so, so to us, it was, it was really important to have that, but what we found surprising, honestly, was how little information there is out there about uh, going up and down these rivers. Uh, there's like local pockets of information, but just like in one place, having everything outlined of, uh, you know, where is some fuel or where can we pump out or, is there shore power? Is there water? Um, is there any place to anchor? Uh, as you'll see, you'll, there's a lot of basalt cliffs out there, and yeah, you can come pretty close to them, but that's not a place where your anchor is going to dig in if you want to if you want to anchor overnight. Um, so we just compiled all that information, um, had that available to to us, obviously, and then now we're making it available through the websites to everybody else. It's a work in progress. Uh, we're slowly. Uh, adding to it and enhancing it, but everything from the bridges uh, to the marinas to points of interest, uh, we're, we're expanding that website and adding to it. Yeah, and as you can see from that last photo, that's um, Lions Ferry Marina up at the, um, up the about halfway up the Snake. Um, once you get beyond Hood River, um, that's where there's really no data. Um, there's lots of guides for the Lower Columbia and you know basically um, downstream of Hood River. But when you start getting up in those areas, as you could tell, they're, they're desolate. There's nobody up there. Um, so back to our map, you can see the little red area on the map. Through that area there, there are tons of sloughs. And to try and even name off, there are hundreds of them. And so many beautiful anchorages and um, just really lovely places and hidden gems that you can find tucked away. They're off the main river, just little side escapes. Um, oftentimes um, tucked in with a bunch of little islands so that you can really be out of sight of any of the commercial traffic and just have a super peaceful time there. Um, so this is one particular one that was our favorite. We, it, I don't even know if it had a name. We called it Three Rivers because it seemed like there were so many islands there that it felt like three rivers were coming together there. But um, we spent a couple nights at Anchor and just had the most calm, peaceful place, even though we were pretty close to the um, opening of the Columbia River. Um, one thing also, um, when you're in the sloughs and down just really anywhere on the um, lower Columbia there is you get tons of wildlife. Um, these are a bunch of sea lions and seals that were fighting over this particular rock. 
um, but there are sea lions that'll swim right up to your boat. Um, lots and lots of um, activity going on, lots of eagles. Um, we see tons of bald eagles. I know up in Vancouver, you guys get those a lot too. Um, we also have seen lots of wolves walking around on the shore when you go into some of these sloughs and in some of the more wooded areas, but really just a fun place to just be present in nature. And lots and of then salmon. Going, and, and lots, lots of and salmon. lots of salmon, lots of salmon and lots of salmon fishermen. Um, and in, fish, in salmon season, you will find hundreds and hundreds of boats all gathered around the same area because they know that's where the salmon are biting and then you have to find a way to navigate. We, um, we call it the minefields of salmon fishermen um, because you have to kind of weave in and out. Uh, the first little town that we fell in love with um, on the upstream side was Cap Lamet. And there's nothing in particular about it except it's this quaint little town that literally has a three block long one street that is the entire town and there's one pizzeria and one brewery. And that's pretty much all they got. I think we looked it up and it was like population of 240 or something like that. Um, but just the super friendliest little place and really just made us feel like we were starting the adventure inland and uh, wanted to share it. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the timing also. Now, this particular trip that we took um, was the upstream we did from July to September. And then the downstream we did from late September until November. Um, but really, if you think about mid to late summer heading upstream um, and allow at least three to four weeks, just depends on you know, how quickly you wanna go through and how many places you wanna stop. But really during that time, uh, most of the winds are coming from the West. So if you follow the river along, you're gonna get most of your downwind sailing and it's gonna be super pleasant. There were a few exceptions. There were days when we had to beat into the wind a little bit here and there, um, but the, um, the primary winds are coming from the West um, during that season. Um, so we were able to sail about 60% of the time. Uh, now keep in mind, whenever you're going through the locks, you have to be under power. So that includes the fact that we had to have the engine running every time we were approaching a lock, sitting in a lock, and then exiting a lock, and then, of course, the marinas. So to really be under sail 60% of the total underway time, um, we were really proud of that. And um, I think we only went through, Peter, you might have to correct me on this, but I think we only went through like 20-something gallons of diesel on the yeah, whole trip, have, like 27 or something. Yeah, I, I have the so, stat somewhere exactly, but it was it was right right about 20 gallons for the entire trip up and downstream. Yeah, round trip, yeah, for the total round trip. So then in the downstream, somewhere around September, we were told, it happened really kind of probably closer to October 1st for us, but the winds shift and start coming from the east. Um, so since you're turning around on a river, that is super helpful. Um, so that you can actually enjoy a little bit of downwind sailing going downstream. Um, now, on the upstream, of course, you have the wind against current that um, Peter already talked about. But on the downstream, if you've got the winds coming from the east, um, then you're really just, you know, cruising along. You've got the current working with you. You've got the wind working with you and you don't have the wind against current. So um, the June to September upstream last year was super, super hot. I don't know if you guys remember, but it was like 108, 110 on some of those hot summer days. So we pulled out what I called my gypsy shades and we figured out all sorts of creative ways to make shade on that. Um, and then on the downstream, you could almost see the colors change before our eyes. Um, it was really awesome to go from that blistery heat to all of a sudden all the trees were just popping in yellows and reds and things like that. Um, and then the further downstream you got, this is Beacon Rock, which we'll talk about in a bit, but um, it's when you start getting into the more lush, damp um, climates, um, the colors just get more and more vibrant. Um, one thing um, as far as the climate, when you get upstream of the Dalles, you're in the desert. When you're downstream of Hood River, you are in the gorge and you're in lush, mountainous waterfalls and moisture. So just to see those two stark differences in a matter of maybe 10 nautical miles, you're going from one extreme to the other um, overnight as you cut through the Cascade Mountains. So pretty cool. 
pretty cool. You can go in the spring, but it rains a lot in the spring, as you guys probably know, in the same part of the world there. Um, and that rain can get super, super cold. Um, you also get a lot of squalls in the spring. Um, and sometimes they pop up very unexpectedly. Um, this was one as we were entering um, Camus Washougal, we were headed downstream and the squall was not predicted and we had no choice. We were underway. There's no other place to stop. So we just had to go right through the middle of it. And it was very short. Luckily, it lasted maybe 30 minutes. And as soon as we got through it, by the time we even got to the docks at the marina we were going to, it was like cleared up and totally fine by the time we were docking. So these things pop up out of nowhere on the river. Yeah. And, and just to highlight again, the, uh, the relevance of the microclimate, not only these, uh, this particular squall just popped up, we actually happened to be next to uh, one of the uh, channel marks, channel buoys, and a uh, big part of those 20 minutes, that was pretty much the only thing we could see. And even though we were under power and going downstream, so the current mm -hmm. was with us, we pretty much saw that uh, that channel marker for the entire 20 minutes. And again, that was our only point of visual point of reference that we had and the wind and everything else was coming against us so heavy that uh, even though we were powering pretty heavily through it, it just barely kept moving right next to us. Yeah. And you could go in the winter, but it gets really, really, really cold. Um, we ended up in this little bit of a snowstorm on the way to Hood River. We were actually that I think this was Christmas Eve or Christmas Day that we were trying Christmas to get Day, to my sister's yeah. house in time. Um, and we always have a saying, we, you can tell somebody where you're going to be or when you're going to be there, but not both. And we made the mistake of committing to my sister that we would be at her house in Hood River by Christmas. And this is what that basically created for us. The good news is, though, for us is our Southerly does have a indoor um, pilot station that has a wheel and um, a windshield wiper and, you know, everything you would need to be able to pilot from inside. Um, Peter did have to go out, I think, about every 30 minutes and scrape the ice, though, because it was refreezing, refreezing faster than uh, the windshield wiper she could, get it, could get it off. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the conditions, this is a quick video, and as you know from photos and videos, the waves aren't um, quite that visible, but uh, um, this is actually just, uh, I don't know, maybe 120 miles inland uh, around a particular area called Cape Horn. We'll have a couple of pictures of it in, in a little bit, but uh, we were going downstream. Uh, and uh, I don't even remember, I think we were under sail here, but uh, uh, the point is, even though you may not get the height of the waves um, that uh, might be endangering, it's uh, the, the quick frequency. Uh, there were times where we would count and uh, the, the waves would be on a, you know, three second sets. Uh, so it's, you're just getting pummeled and you're either beating into it or it's even coming with you as it was in this case. And even though the, uh, the waves and current were, were both coming with us, and I think it was the wind as well in this particular case, uh, we were still hobby horsing and rolling and uh, just moving all, all around uh, because the wave frequency is, is, uh, is so close together. Um, so here's another one of our uh, favorite spots as, uh, as we kind of intermingle uh, some of our favorite destinations with the more technical aspects of, of our presentation uh, is a little town of St. Helens. Um, a really a nice place with public docks. Speaking of uh, currents, uh, these public docks are infamous amongst the local uh, people for uh, being challenging. Uh, if uh, this, is, this is one of those areas where you definitely wanna uh, look at the charts. Um, the, uh, the, the, the current reverses all the way up, almost up to St. Helens, sometimes even in St. Helens, which is probably about 80 miles inland. Uh, so the tidal influence um, down towards Astoria might be four, six, maybe eight feet uh, at the you know, new moon or full moon. Uh, up uh, towards St. Helens, it shows a little bit with a tidal difference, but really where it shows up the most is the current. So even when you're traversing, it's, uh, it's worthwhile keeping an eye on it because that can definitely either help you or work against you, uh, depending on if the high tide's coming in or the tide's going out. Um, but uh, this is a really cool place. Again, a couple of breweries, uh, little antique stores. Uh, they have community events and festivals. 
uh, movie nights uh, right in the park by the marina. So you can just walk off your boat and it's uh, free. I believe it's for three days to stay there. Um, you know, they don't want people camping out there for weeks at a time, but uh, for three nights or five nights, you can stay there. Um, just pay for shore power and water if that's what you need or just stay for free. Um, the other beautiful part of these docks is uh, just in the background here. Uh, you see, this is not the whole river. This is actually just a little channel outside of St. Helens. And the island you see back there called Sand Island has another set of docks uh, that belong to the city and are maintained by them very nicely. Uh, so you can pull up there, uh, spend a night in a little bit quieter area, very popular picnic place. You can go and kind of hike and circumnavigate uh, that Sand Island. Uh, just really nice places, a lot of, uh, especially on the lower Columbia, a lot of places for uh, the recreational, uh, recreational users. Uh, another favorite uh, stop just outside of St. Helens is on Coon Island. So as you get to St. Helens, there is a, a channel called Multnomah Channel that splits up and uh, creates a uh, Savi Island, which is actually the largest freshwater island in uh, North America. So uh, as you go, you can go up through the main channel or you can go through Multnomah Channel. Um, there is, again, several nice places. One of them is Coon Island. It's just a small, um, small little island that uh, we call it. We, we're going to circumnavigate, which means we get on the dock and we walk around the island. And I think we can walk around it in less than a half hour. Um, but just a very calm, very peaceful, um, amazing scenery. It's just uh, little uninhabited um, islands that uh, that offers docks and uh, and, a, and a great place to stop. Um, so, as you get more into the you know up the Columbia, the first bridge is going to be in Astoria. Second bridge uh, is up at uh, um, Longview. Um, uh, Longview, and then. <laughs> Uh, just beyond St. Helens, as you approach Portland, you're going to see a lot of the different bridges. And um, so a lot of different heights, a lot of different either opening or not. Uh, communication is via VHF. Um, and again, as we were going upstream, part of the challenge was there was just, I mean, obviously we have charts, but there was so little information as to what type of bridges. Some of these are automated, meaning that there's nobody tending to the bridge. You just call on VHF and it's relayed somewhere else to somebody who's sitting in an office and pushing a button. Um, but this particular bridge was a little bit of a concern because um, different charts and different communications had, um, had uh, listed different open clearances. So I found a phone number for the operator on the bridge uh, that's uh, right in the middle there on, on the bridge, their, their little cabin there. So I called them up and I said, hey, uh, we're planning a trip up here. Uh, this is all the way up towards Kennewick. And I said, uh, what is the clearance of your bridge uh, when you're fully open? Because we have a mast. Um, and normally we quote people and we just say we're 55 feet, even though we're 52 one inch. Um, and he says, well, uh, you know, it's it's I think for maintenance, we can open it up to 55, but you know, if you just pull up, we'll just eyeball it and make sure you can get through. Um, you don't wanna go 300 some odd miles upstream to get to a bridge so that you can eyeball it to see if we can go through. So again, another reason why we decided to kind of publish all the information that we've collected from, from our journey. Again, it's not fully exhaustive and everything else, but if you've got a mask, then you need to know. Uh, we'll, we'll share all the information and the phone numbers and everything. So long story short, we did manage to uh, get underneath this bridge uh, without any issues. Uh, there is another bridge further up the Snake River. Um, and by the way, all the way up to Idaho, you get, the, I guess we don't have a picture of that, but you get cruise ships, uh, these river cruises that go up and down. And what we did in uh, basically a month up and months downstream, they do in about six days. Uh, which I, we feel like it misses a lot of the, the highlights of uh, what this area has to offer. But this one particular bridge is listed on a chart as 51.10 feet. And um, it's interesting because 51.10 feet uh, is, if, if you're really going down to the inches, it's not the same thing as 51 feet, 10 inches, right? Um, because of the, of the 0.10 versus 51 feet, 10 inches. So we talked to a lot of people in the area. And again, very little information. There is people that may go fishing or take out their pontoon boat or ski boat kind of in the, in the local areas. But there was very little uh, information from people actually traveling across this region. 
Um, and what we found helpful was as we were going through some of these areas, Kennewick was another one of those where we were not quite sure what the bridge height was uh, because different charts had, had different notation. Um, so here uh, we called up one of those uh, smaller cruise ships and asked them like, hey, what's your air clearance? And when you go under that bridge, do you have any problems? And uh, sure enough, they actually say, yeah, we'll take down all of our VHF antennas and everything else that's, that's on the ship. Uh, sometimes because again, depending on the dams releasing the water, uh, the water height will change sometimes by a foot or two. So even those cruise ships, when they approach, they usually have somebody up on the top deck as they're making approach to the bridge to ensure that there is no incidence of, um, of um, you know, colliding or anything like that. So uh, in the springtime, the cruise ships did tell us some of them that are just a little bit higher. They said, yeah, we only go up, let's say to Lions Ferry, and this bridge being just a few miles beyond Lions Ferry, uh, but it just gave us so much consternation. This was kind of like, okay, we might just be only able to get here and not go any further. We were inching up to that bridge, kind of floating, kind of in neutral, you know, hand on the throttle, ready to throw it in reverse. Um, it, it was gut wrenching, and even on the back, uh, on the on the downstream side, it did not make it any easier to go underneath uh, such a tight bridge. Um, and then the final place is uh, in uh, in Lewiston, between Lewiston and Clarkston. Adrian? Yeah, so the Blue Bridge um, is really where the road stops for sailboats. Um, the open um, size is, or the open height is 42 feet, which even if it was open, obviously that's not enough for us. Um, but even that, they are very, very reluctant to open it and are not super friendly to any pleasure craft that are requesting that. So really that's as far as you can go. Um, but the truth is to go beyond the Blue Bridge, um, the Snake River also gets much more shallow. Um, Hell's Canyon is in there, which we'll share with you a little bit about it later, but there's not much to go beyond there anyway, just because of the depth. So when you see the Blue Bridge, you know you're at the end of the road, um, but yeah. Yeah, the bridges, gonna... bridges are definitely bridges are definitely a big part of this, and uh, yeah. coming into Portland, that's uh, very obvious. Yeah, so coming into Portland, as I was going to say, coming into Portland, if you come down the Willamette, um, it's not very far down or upstream, down as in south, um, but if you come upstream on the Willamette, um, I think there are seven or eight bridges just on that little section alone, um, because obviously you're going right into downtown Portland, so there's a lot of um, pedestrian, bicycle, and um, car traffic that's crisscrossing back and forth all those bridges constantly. So that is a heavy bridge area. But if you're willing to um, deal with that and you're willing to talk through all of the openings, you can go to the public marina that is literally right there in downtown Portland, um, which is really kind of a cool place. Um, they do concerts on the lawn right by the uh, marina there all sorts of arts and museums and music and restaurants. And if you like the city vibe, the city lights there are just really incredible. And to be on this whole nature river trip and then all of a sudden find yourself in this urban funky town, um, it's the only place on the Columbia where that happens. Every other town along the Columbia is more like a fishing village or like a little quaint town. And then you get Portland right there. So to me, worth a stop to, to hop upstream on the, um, on the Willamette just to go visit Portland. But then once you go past Portland and keep going upstream, um, my personal favorite stop is Beacon Rock. Um, Beacon Rock is the opposite end of the spectrum of Portland. Um, it is completely secluded. There's nothing there except the park um, and such dramatic um, landscape. The rock itself, Beacon Rock, is the second largest freestanding monolithic rock in the Northern Hemisphere. The only monolith larger than Beacon Rock is the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, so I did not realize that that is right there on the Columbia River. It's 848 feet tall and it is a single, um, single stone. Um, we did hike up to the top in this picture here. So that's a view of our boat down at the docks there um, when we are not quite at the top because the top actually faces the other direction but almost at the top of Beacon Rock there. Um, so it's, it's quite a journey. This particular picture is just one of my favorites. It was actually taken in the winter time. So everything was utterly still in the mist and fog. Um, and we were the absolutely only people there at Beacon Rock. And for us, that's just a beautiful way to experience it. 
If you're doing this in the off season, um, do we expect that um, you know some of the water or pump out facilities, or even in this case, we had to call the park ranger and say, because uh, we were planning on staying for several days, and as you can tell from this uh, from this no picture, <laughs> yeah, no sun for solar recharge of our batteries. Um, so while we did run our diesel heater, we needed a little bit of extra oomph. And uh, we had to call the park ranger and say, is there any way you can kind of flip that breaker and, and turn on those uh, power pedestals on the docks? Uh, so we had, uh, we had an interesting experience. As a matter of fact, I remember one time we were there in December, uh, they, uh, they actually let us stay there for free because they're like, you know, nobody ever comes out. If you're braving this and, and coming up here, you can just, just hang out as, as long as you want. So um, there was a lot of admiration for us. Um, another part that's uh, interesting about Beacon Rock is, so it's about 142 miles inland on the Columbia, plus of course you've got the Willamette to explore. All of the stops that we've shared with you so far that are our favorite stops are before you get to the first dam. So if for whatever reason you feel like uh, the navigating through the locks is going to be a challenge that you don't want to undertake or anything like that, Everything we've shared so far is completely accessible with a dredge channel, well-marked bridges that will open up for you. Some of them on schedule, depending, especially around downtown Portland. But I really want to emphasize that uh, for those, and we met a lot of people along the way, they're like, oh, you went through a lock. I, I would never venture out to do that. We went through eight of them on the upstream and eight back downstream, but uh, we found it, uh, you know, challenging enough, but uh, uh but not uh, not necessarily a problem if you if you prepare for it. So, uh, so hey, let's, Peter, let me interrupt you. Let me uh -huh. interrupt you real quick because someone put a question in the chat that I want to make sure is clear while we're talking about it. How did you get past Portland? Was the question when okay. you go to Portland, you go upstream on the Willamette. The only way to get back, you've got to go downstream back on the Willamette, back to the Columbia, back where you picked up the Willamette. There's no connection through, so you don't technically go past Portland you get to Portland, you can actually go just a tad bit further, maybe what, five or six miles further. Yeah, But that's the, about the, as far as you can go. And then you turn around and go back. The total channel or, or saleable or navigable port of the Willamette River is only about 26 miles, at which point you get to a uh, to a fall, uh, which is really cool. It's kind of like a miniature Niagara Falls, uh, a big destination for people to go check it out. And there is moorage nearby. Um, but uh, those locks were discontinued, the operation was discontinued actually just pretty recently, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, but that's the extent of uh, navigating up and down the, the Willamette, so about 26 miles. So then you turn around, go back, you rejoin the Columbia, and then you continue heading up uh, towards Beacon Rock and towards right. the dams. So, um, so yeah, so let's talk about these, uh, these dams. Um, uh, very intimidating. I will say, I, I still remember the first time when uh, we were coming in uh, to, to the Bonneville Dam, which by the way, the Bonneville Dam is great because they're so used to uh, recreational traffic that they, I called them up on the phone several days before. They kind of gave me all the, the rundown of how to communicate, what they're going to be looking for. You know, of course, everybody's got to have their PFDs on. Um, they were just super friendly and then and, and talked us through the entire process. Um, but um, yeah, if it's, it's still intimidating. And to, to this day, I mean, you're, you're going in and uh, this, this thing is 86 feet wide. And remember when I said the barges, they're double wide and double long? Well, the, the, the lock is 86 feet wide and these barges are 84 feet wide. So they have a foot on either side and they could get in and out of the lock. And several lock masters have told us they, these, these guys can, these barges can get in and out without ever touching the wall. How they do it, I have no idea. Um, but just realize that this is a commercial uh, commercial traffic area and it's built for them. And the further upstream you go, the less, I mean, Bonneville is probably the one where they, they anticipate a lot more uh, recreational traffic further up. It's quite unusual to see it. Uh, they're very kind, very cordial. Um, the other thing is this place, this, uh, the, the, the lock is, each lock is 670 feet long. Right, um, and again, these double barges, 84 feet wide. These barges are 650 feet long, so uh, that's more than two football fields. So when you're pulling in, and especially if you're going, you know, obviously you're, you're going to be going upstream first. Um, you're coming into this giant concrete canyon. You know, your spreaders, 
you're looking at that, you're just, I mean, it's, it's intimidating, no, no doubt about that. Um, when, uh, uh, when, when we go through, um, this is a time lapse of uh, one of the first times we went through Bonneville Dam. Uh, there are floating bits there, which is uh, very convenient, so you don't have to keep moving your line. Uh, but it does take a lot of coordination, uh, you know, some boat hook adjustments and everything else. Once you get it down, it's, it's not that bad. Um, in the summer, they have a recreational schedule where they slot out uh, not at 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and then depending on daylight, 9 p.m. on the upstream and then on the half hour to the downstream. So there is commercial traffic. Uh, they have to wait. Uh, they have to wait and, uh, and you have to, uh, you have priority as a, as a recreational vessel. Otherwise, it's quite possible because again, it's a busy, uh, busy area. It's quite possible that you might have to wait for an hour or more uh, before you're able to get there. Um, there is uh, different uh, areas of, you know, and different construction methods of how they open up the gates. Um, this one is at the Dallas Dam. Adrian, you want to take this one? Yeah, so the Dallas Dam is two folding doors that open and close. Um, and as Peter said earlier, the Bonneville Dam is super friendly. They're used to recreational traffic because that is downstream of Hood River. A lot of people go to Hood River and that's as far as they go. So the Bonneville Dam is used to it. Uh, once the further upstream you go, the less and less familiar with having recreational traffic the Lockmasters are. Um, when you get up on the snake, um, having recreational traffic is like a novelty to them and really fun to chat with them. Um, but the Dallas Dam, we didn't know that it might be a good idea to discuss with them the fill speed um, that they are going to um, be filling the, the, filling the lock um, because we were used to the Bonneville where they already kind of understood what to do differently. Um, so it definitely was a learning experience for us. Um, we did get tied up on the port side as we always do. Um, we have a long skinny, it's five feet long, I think, a long skinny tube type fender that I attached to the midship that pretty much protects us from the whole wall. Um, and we had everything, what we thought was the typical tie up and the turbulence effect because of the speed that they were filling this lock was extraordinary. Um, I was on the bow, as I always am, and the effect of it pulling the nose off the wall was nearly more than I could hold on to the line. Um, obviously, I had my gloves on, I was standing, I was leveraged, um, but I was envisioning our boat spinning around and slamming against those concrete walls and was on the verge of, I think I actually hollered to you a couple times, I don't think I can hold it. Um, and just squatting down as low leverage, you know, weight in my body as I could. Um, I did hold on, thank goodness. Um, we did make it. Once he got to the almost full point, he started slowing down. And that was probably the biggest sigh of relief. Uh, but a lesson that I learned on that is when we're tying the lines, always make sure that I double back the mooring line. Don't just tie from the midship around the bit and then hold it on the bow because that's not enough leverage points um, taking weight off of that line. So instead, tie it on one of the, um, on one of the um, cleats up on the bow, go back, twist it around, bring it back, and then loop it back under that um, cleat again so that you have multiple layers of leverage pulling on it. Um, the other thing we learned um, is to remind the Lockmasters as we're going in, hey, we're a sailboat, could you please do it at half speed? Um, and sometimes they are super nice about it and sometimes they're impatient with you, but we learn to ask. Yeah, not only we learn to ask, uh, we, we learn to emphasize and basically state what is it that we need. So again, these big barges, commercial traffic, uh, they make this entire trip from Lewiston to Portland in about 48 hours. So when they're going up or downstream through these locks, uh, they can fill up this, uh, this giant lock in probably 10 minutes, 12 minutes, I think is, is the official speed for filling it up. So when we ask for half speed, uh, it, makes, it makes quite a substantial difference. Going down is nowhere near as intimidating because the water is just flowing out from underneath you. But going upstream, there is definitely some trepidation with that. Now, 
speaking of trepidation, uh, there was this is a kind of a guillotine style door on on one of the locks. Um, I think this was on John Day, and yeah, as, John we Day. Were, as we were approaching, we had probably twenty five to you know winds gusting up to thirty coming from behind. So already at this point, as I'm approaching the lock, I've got the uh, I've got the uh, throttle in neutral, and we're still being pushed in pretty rapidly. Uh, way more, way faster than than I was comfortable with. So I'm trying to slow us down with uh, with a little bit of reverse, uh, but the wind keeps pushing. Then of course I'm losing rudder control, uh, so it was challenging. And um, about this this point in 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 the in the approach, um, I grabbed the radio and I asked the lockmaster. I said, you know, I said it would really help us out that as soon as we get through the through the gate through the guillotine gate, can you start closing it down? so that uh, we don't have these winds hitting us and bouncing off the walls and everything else. And he just gets back on the radio kind of, you know, very serious going, yeah, that's, that's not the procedure. Uh, you need to get in and tie up and then we can start closing the lock. Um, that's their standard operating procedure when it comes to commercial traffic. So we're, we just kind of looked at each other and go, okay, well, we, we're going to have to work with what, what we got to work with. It wasn't 10 seconds later, uh, maybe 15, he says, I consulted with my supervisor. We're going to help you out and start closing it right away. And, and we just kind of had a sigh of just a little bit of relief of going, okay, at least one thing that's going to help us out here. Because again, trying to get into this uh, concrete canyon when uh, you're being buffeted by 25, 30 knot winds, uh, trying to grab onto a bit, uh, not fun, not fun. Um, and speaking of bit, and I don't know if it was the same dam or it was different. I mean, some, some, some of these uh, experiences kind of run together. Um, you end up with four bits on either side of the dock, uh, of, the, of the lock. So as we're approaching, generally, we don't like the very first one. There is a lot of turbulence and kind of water splashing off the uh, downstream door. So we usually go to the second or third one. Um, don't want to go to the fourth one because you kind of run out of options afterwards and you're up against another giant concrete wall. So that's not a preferred place to be. Um, and again, those, those concrete walls can be pretty intimidating. Here you can see one of those floating bits. So we're approaching, we passed the first one. We got some wind pushing us from behind. Um, you slowing us down, going in reverse, accounting for some of our port kick. And, uh, we're going to the second bit. Well, the wind is still too strong, still pushing us. And so I'm letting Adrian know, okay, we're gonna go to the third bit. Uh, by that point, I can definitely slow down and have uh, good control and approach the wall and the bit, uh, you know, calmly. So we get there and we're maybe, I don't know, 20 feet off the bow where the bit is supposed to be. And the cutout is there, but there is just no bit in there whatsoever. So now we've passed the first one. We, we, you know, we were too fast and not positioned properly for the second one. And now the third bit is missing. And I can't convey the, the not fear, but just like, I mean, concrete walls, big wall, door at the very top of the, of the lock. And um, now I'm thinking, okay, am I going to take a run at the fourth bit? But if I miss it, if the wind, if, if some swirl happens, there or something, uh, I've got three walls around me, right? So what to do now? So in the midst of that, as we're approaching the, the, where the third bit's supposed to be, um, I, I yelled out at Adrian and I said, I'm gonna make a U-turn, okay? And so in an 86 wide concrete walls on either side uh, lock, I make a probably a five point turn using my port kick to my advantage, uh, managed to swing the boat all the way around. And so we still tied up on the port side, but we were actually facing downstream as they were lifting us up. Of course, that confused the lock master because they're like, uh, are you, because we called them up, said, okay, we're all secure, ready to go up. Please remember to go slow. And he's like, um, I don't see you. Where the heck are you in the lock? All right. So we have to explain to them that uh, because of that missing bit, we swung around we're pointing downstream, we're safely tied up. You know, we didn't have the lines on starboard to just make the switch and moving laterally 86 feet didn't seem like a, a very doable thing in, in winds, especially with the port kick that we have. So uh, sometimes you have to improvise is the, is the lesson from all of this is sometimes you have to improvise and yeah, the pucker factor goes to 11, uh, but uh, we managed through that lock and again, made another U-turn as we exited and continued on our, on our upstream journey. And uh, this is Lomo. Yeah, that's Lomo, Lower Monumental. 
Um, this is actually um, the dam that we ended up taking a tour of and got to see all the inside operations of as well, um, which was pretty awesome. But um, going up to this dam, um, if you remember, Peter told you about the lock through schedules that at 12 o'clock, three o'clock and six, oh, nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, three o'clock and six o'clock, pleasure crafts get priority. Um, and for the most part, we were the only pleasure craft on the Snake River. This is one of the ones on the snake. Actually, it wasn't even for the most part. I don't think we ever saw another pleasure craft while we were, no, we didn't go in no. up the snake. So um, we were always trying to be very respectful of the commercial timing and always make sure that we were there within that 30 minute window right before our um, timing. And oftentimes we would get there a little early and just let them know we were there and they would let us go right away. So we were kind of getting this timing thing down pretty well. And on this particular one, we showed up maybe 15 minutes before and we had been monitoring the VHF traffic um, all along as we were working our way towards it. And we knew that there was a large double barge um, that was coming upstream that had been talking to the lockmaster, letting him know that he was on his way up. And just as we got there about 15 minutes before our time, the barge was coming in and he was on the radio with the lockmaster and explaining that he's behind schedule and he really needs to go through and this is really important. And can he just lock through with the sailboat? And our hearts dropped yeah, he, because he, he we wants, didn't know. Maybe, he, he maybe it was to... our lack of experience. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is something they do. We didn't know. But yeah, yeah he explained the double on the radio, and then yeah. The, then the pusher is right next to it. So he does have technically a little bit of a cutout right next to him. And he's like, yeah, they can just hit tie next to me. Um, yeah, because yeah, the tug actually only goes behind one of the two barges. So there's actually an empty space. And he's explaining that to the lockmaster. He's like, this is going to work out great because I've got this space and the sailboat can just tie up right here. And Peter and I are just like, we don't know what to say. Do we jump on the radio and interrupt their conversation, but we don't want to be rude. We want to be respectful. And we just sat on the boat and held our breath. And it was so awesome. The moment the lockmaster came over and said, no, sir, the sailboat goes alone. And we were just like massive sigh of relief that um, this wasn't something that they were going to expect us to do. So we got, we got to love our lockmasters. Yeah, and and again, a uh, lot of stories, and and again, uh, a lot of increased heart rate as you go through. Just again, the experience is is uh, is worth it, in my opinion. Uh, so we definitely don't want to discourage you from trying it out. But just like anything in in sailing, this is uh, this is one of those things where you get more experience and everything else. Uh, you definitely need to pay attention, not be in a hurry, communicate well have your crew and everything else and understand how to control your boat. It's absolutely doable. I have no hesitation uh, doing this all over again. Uh, just know that there is variables, some of them which you can control, some of them which you can. Uh, so as much as we're sharing some of these dramatic moments, we don't want to discourage you. We actually want to encourage you to say, just prepare well and venture off. Oh, you muted somehow, Peter. Sorry. Um, the uh, the rewards are as soon as you get, let's say, through Bonneville. Again, one of our favorite stops, a little quaint town right uh, alongside the the Columbia Gorge. Um, beautiful scenery, a couple of breweries in town, a really famous fish market that just uh, uh, buys the local fish that's uh, fresh. Um, a public dock maintained by the city. Uh, just a, just a really cool place to go and uh, spend a little time. This is Bridge of the Gods. Uh, a lot of kind of the Native American uh, lore about how it got created, why it's called the Bridge of the Gods. Uh, a lot of history there with the, with the old locks before Bonneville Dam was built. Um, just a really, really interesting uh, place. And of course, um, it wouldn't be the Columbia Gorge um, and you can see on the very right side, the tiny little people there. So this is a waterfall and, and lots of hiking opportunities, a lot of waterfalls, a lot of nature. Of course, everybody knows Malnoma Falls or Bridal Veil Falls or things like that, which you can see right from the Columbia as you're passing by. Uh, and there are a couple of places where you could anchor and dinghy over to shore and maybe go on your own. But there is plenty other areas and plenty other spaces where you can get off the boat uh, stretch your legs, whether it's up on Beacon Rock or towards uh, waterfalls like this, uh, literally hundreds of waterfalls in the area. 
Um, also, another favorite stop, this is just the, past the Dallas and the Dallas Dam. Um, amazing, amazing Anchorage uh, spots uh, where the, the sunsets and sunrises and just the area is just so calm, uh, very little of any kind of other traffic, uh, even though the shipping channels out there in this particular case in Miller, Miller Island, you're kind of tucked into a little cove away from the main shipping channel. So you can just kind of maybe see the, the tops of the ships passing by, but you're not affected by the wake or much by the current. Uh, it's just uh, really offers stunning views of the vineyards. This is Mary Hill Vineyards up there on the hill. Uh, it's just, uh, there is no access to it. There's no dock to get there unless you get, get off somewhere else and maybe take a, a taxi or something like that, that you could, uh, you could go there, but plenty of other wineries to explore. But just the, the, the scenery, um, it's, it's stunning and it's, it just changes with every turn and twist of the river. Um, this was, uh, I think this was one of the sunsets that uh, we were hanging out on the boat. Um, again, the, the, the cliffs, the starkness of the dry land and the vineyard as you go further in, as Adrian was saying, a lot of this is desert uh, as you're approaching Idaho. It's just stunning, stunning views. Yeah, so one of our other favorites is a little place called Crow Butte. Um, it's an Indian reservation land, actually. It's a little island, um, and it's got hidden docks on the backside of the island that if you were just sailing by, you wouldn't even know that there's anything there. You have to know to go into the backside of the island where you're going to find these really well-maintained, beautiful docks. Um, and it is super welcoming to boaters, and there's a campground there. As long as you're respectful that it's Indian grounds, they are more than happy to have people come and stay there um, as long as, like I said, as long as you're respectful that these are sacred places for them. Um, one thing that I loved about Crow Butte is if you are willing to do a three mile uphill walk, um, there's a beautiful vineyard up there. You can actually almost see it. I think you can see it there on the top of the hill, um, but it's three miles uphill to get to Alexandria and Nicole um, Winery, which was one of our favorites on this whole trip. And they actually have the vineyards right there and they'll let you go walk through the vineyards and actually pick the grapes off of the, off of the vines and then take it in and taste your grape against the wine that that particular grape made. Um, so super fun way to spend an afternoon. And luckily after you drink all that wine, the three mile um, walk is, down, is downhill. So you can make it back to your boat um, without as much strenuous exercise. So, we also wanted to mention, um, because right as you get past um, Pro Butte is when you really start getting into where they actually have yacht clubs this far inland. Longview is actually further downstream, um, but there's occasionally these little yacht clubs sprinkled around the rivers. And they're super hospitable and just lovely people. And we didn't know at the time, we actually weren't members of any particular yacht club. Um, and we would just call them on the telephone and they heard we're coming on a sailboat and they said, absolutely no problem. We don't care. Now we are members of a yacht club. So um, now we actually do have reciprocal privileges. Um, but at the time we didn't really know the process. Um, but this particular club, Longview Yacht Club, we let them know we were coming. Um, they're kind of in the middle of nowhere. There's no like people that actually stay there but they drove out just to make sure and meet us and make sure we got tied up safely. Um, they unlocked all the doors to the Yacht Club for us, um, showed us how to use their pizza oven, showed us how to, you know, get ice from their ice maker, use all of their facilities and showers and anything else we needed, and um, just really treated us with family, um, treated us like family. The next Yacht Club we got to is just as the Columbia River um, starts turning to the north, um, right at the base of, um, right at the south edge there of the Columbia River, just before it does the northbound turn. And that is the Walla Walla Yacht Club. And again, I mean, the, the reception is just so amazing, especially the further upstream you get, because they never get visitors. And just the fact that you tell them that you're coming in on a 37 foot sailboat and you're coming all the way upstream, they just get so excited. They send people down to greet you at the dock and they just want to like roll out the red carpet. Um, at this particular one, Walla Walla, there's a hike to the Twin Sisters, which is the rock you see there in the background. Um, they saw us get off the boat and they were there doing some cleaning, I think, um, in the parking lot there. 
and they asked us where we were going and we're like, oh, we're going to go hike to Twin Sisters. They gave us their mobile number and they said, well, if you get tired and you want us to come pick you up and not have to hike all the way back, we'll come drive up and get you. And, you know, if you want to take a car, you're welcome to take one of our cars. So again, they just, they just treat you like family because they just never get guests and they're just excited to have us. Um, at the Walla Walla, this is actually sitting on the stern of our boat at the guest dock. Um, they had a concert, it was their summer party, and there's a live band up on the balcony. You can not really see, you can see the lights there on the far left, but there was a live band right there. And we ended up making the stern of our boat a dance floor and just participated in their summer party. And, you know, they came by, offered beers, anything we needed. And um, yeah, we get to participate in parties all over the place, it seems. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot. There, there was a lot of hospitalities, you know, further up in uh, towards Kennewick. Uh, there is the Clover Island Yacht Club. Once we got uh, beyond a couple of the bridges there that were questionable and eyeballed it uh, to get through. Uh, this, this is a club actually where they mostly have uh, they actually have all motorboats and uh, they have uh, those uh, little boathouses that they store them inside of and everything else. But a really popular club and. Um, uh, we we docked at the public docks. We we're going around the Clover Island and just kind of uh, getting our bearings and everything else. And when uh, we walked by Clover Island, they said, "Oh, you're you're visitors. Yeah, just move over to our docks. We'll let you. You know, you don't need to stay at the city docks. You can stay here. It's behind a locked gate. You know, power, water, whatever you need." I mean, they were super nice about it. And then on the upstream, so we're going upstream in the summer, and they're like, "Well." when are you going to come downstream? And we're like, oh, you know, roughly, I mean, we didn't have a particular schedule. We just had a rough idea. And they're like, well, we're going to be having our Oktoberfest. I think it was at the end of September. So they're like, you should time it in such a way. So you're back here for the Oktoberfest. So not only they saved us a spot in a very crowded, uh, very, very popular Oktoberfest party. Um, there was, they had dueling pianos and uh, had uh, songs dedicated to us and just like appreciating the fact uh, that we were out there and, uh, and, and then visited with them. Like, a, like Adrian said, uh, they just don't get that many visitors. So when you do show up, um, they, they really treated us like the rock stars that we are. So um, a few more little favorite stops we'll run through. Um, McNary has a yacht club, um, but their uh, marina has not been dredged in many, many years. So when we called them to let them know we were coming, they very sadly said that there's no way we're going to be able to make it into the opening at their marina. But they offered and said, why don't you anchor right outside of our marina? And it's a beautiful anchor spot and we'd love to have you. But um, yeah, you just can't get in. So the next time we came by, we ended up staying on the opposite side of that little peninsula. Um, it's the same peninsula that you see there, but that's the back side of it where Hat Rock is located. Um, so we were able to just tie up to the little um, state park dock there and then walk around to the Yacht Club um, and actually had some beautiful time there as well. And then we got to the very furthest navigable point on the Columbia, which is Richland. And beyond that, we actually walked up the shoreline to see how narrow and shallow it gets when you get beyond that. And that is absolutely as far as you can go. But one thing about Richland is it has got to be the friendliest people on the planet. Um, we walked up and down the um, trail that ran along the river. And I don't think a single person walked by us without a big grin on their face and waving and saying hello. And is there anything we need? And um, they've got amazing free docks available. We actually asked the local, I think it was a park ranger of some sort, um, about the fact that they were free. And they were like, yeah, we get so few guests that by calling it free, we get more tax dollars than we would ever get from actually collecting from the few people that ever come here. So if we were to start charging, we would actually get less revenue by charging because we never get anybody here, but it's these giant free available docks that no one ever uses. Um, but they did give us a great place to reprovision, do laundry, um, basically just get set for the Snake River where we knew that um, resources were gonna be scarce once we got on the snake. So it gave us a chance to really stop and reprovision and get resettled. Um, there was a Costco there, which was awesome. And um, one thing we learned about provisioning, which I know probably all of you guys know was 
everything gets labeled, detail spreadsheets, where everything would be, and um, just making sure that we were very aware of when there was going to be anything again. Um, in some of our cases, there were grocery stores up and down the Columbia that were convenient in just a few towns. We have them in our spreadsheet, so I knew exactly where there would be a place where we could get groceries. Some of them, like in the Dalles, it was a two and a half mile walk each way to get to the closest grocery store. So when we got there, we knew it's just going to be a long walking day and then we'll come back with lots of bags on our shoulders and all of that. Um, but then there were some places, many places where there's absolutely nothing, or maybe there's just like one little tiny, like 7-Eleven type market. So if you need something desperate, fine, but that's all you're going to get. Um, but I will say that once you get past Richland, like all the way up the snake, there is zero. There are no grocery stores, no 7-Elevens, no nothing. Um, so as we were leaving Richland, it was, we need to make sure that until we get to Clarkston, which was a couple weeks, maybe two and a half weeks, we just need to make sure that there's absolutely nothing that we need because there's going to be nothing available. And we Except, managed. Yeah, we managed just fine. Yeah, we managed to also live off the land. And uh, what we found interesting, especially in the late summer as we were heading upstream, uh, up through the gorge, uh, there was just uh, blackberries everywhere. I mean, you could literally pick them by the bushel. And so we did and um, figure out some creative ways to to prepare them. Um, Adrian does does an amazing job uh, in the galley and just being creative with what actually is there, even when we don't have provisioning for a couple of weeks. Um, then further upstream as we went, and it was uh, later summer, start, starting early fall, um, just giant peach trees right off, uh, right off the docks. So um, we went and asked people, or like, is this anybody's property or anything? Because these look pretty yummy. So we went and picked a, a, a basket full of uh, peaches that uh, ended up on a lot of our pancakes and uh, a lot of breakfast meals, or just as a as a snack. So just because a Seven Eleven isn't available. Uh, we definitely found some creative ways to uh, to use what was provided by nature. So once we got onto the snake, like I said, there were zero resources, um, but that actually is awesome for us. And we love just going into more of the nature secluded places. One of our favorites was Fish Hook Park, which had no electric, no water, no nothing, but just a dock and a beautiful park that we could walk around. Uh, we first got there, it was Labor Day weekend when we first arrived, and oh my goodness, the place was packed with ski boats and motor boats and pontoons and families and floaties and all sorts of things. Um, but on the downstream, about maybe three weeks later, um, three or four or whatever, it was totally secluded because the park was closed. And when we got off the dock, we walked around and noticed that all of the streets had all of the big gates closed. So there was no way anybody could get to the park. The only way to get to it at that point would be by boat. Um, but they leave the dock. Obviously, the docks are there. They have no problem with people staying. But we actually preferred the, um, the secluded Fishhook Park. And, and speaking of seclusion, so now we're talking about some of the stops along the, along the Snake River. Um, first of all, no cell phone signal. Uh, we got to Fish Hook, which is maybe 10, 11 miles into the Snake River. And pretty much until you get to Lewiston, Clarkston, maybe five miles outside of it. Nothing. Um, nothing. Just no cell phone signal. Uh, VHF only goes so far because the basalt cliffs and, and just the, the landscape there. And then also a lot of the a lot of the boats have to take, like I was saying, for the for the bridges, they have to take down the uh, the VHF antenna. So uh, you get to talk to them maybe just a little bit beyond what you can see visually, uh, see them on AIS, et cetera. But other than that, the commercial traffic uh, is pretty much the only thing. And some days we didn't see anybody. Um, New York Island Anchorage was just this amazing place. So um, again, just, just to share with you kind of how dramatically the, the landscape changes. Down on the lower Columbia around Astoria, the Columbia River is actually up to nine miles wide in places, right? So you've got these giant expanses of water. Then you go up through the gorge where the river might be only a quarter mile wide which comes with its current and the winds and everything else. And then it broadens out again. Well, Snake River tends to be more kind of uh, canyon-like, uh, but they're uh, right around the, the island called New York Island. Uh, there is the main channel and then there is a whole separate area kind of behind it. And uh, we just anchored out there. It was beautiful, still. 
Um, I think we hung out for, for a couple of nights and just, uh, you know, not having had any cell phone or internet signal, we just had to uh, enjoy each other's company, read some books, do a few projects on the boat, and it was absolutely magical. A little um, swimming in the river. <clears throat> yep, jumping in the water and, and uh, getting a little swim. Uh, I mean, all of that was just absolutely magnificent. And uh, then just a little bit further up from there, just before you get to Lewiston and Clarkston, there is, again, another island called Silcott Island uh, that has a park. And this was not unusual. As a matter of fact, Crow Butte, Fish Hook, uh, there was a couple other places, including uh, Silcott Island, where you'll have a park with some kind of facilities. And they're set up, generally speaking, for the RVs and campers, etc. But they'll have some type of a, a dock facility uh, where, as you're transiting, you can tie up. Uh, I think all of those, uh, actually, this one, we knew that we were supposed to pay. So we went to the campground host. And <clears throat> again, beautiful open place. Uh, we're past Labor Day weekend, so not a whole lot of uh, people out there. And we went to the campground host and said, you know, we, we're trying to pay. We're here on a boat. And he's like, well, there is a drop box, you know, for your whatever, $5 at the, at the ram. Because he kept thinking we brought our boat on a trailer and we dropped it uh, on a ram. And we're like, no, 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 like we're here on a boat. Like we came on a boat. And he's like, no, no, just just put your $5 in there. And we're like- Yeah, and he's okay. like, oh, you can park the car there with your trailer. He's pointing yeah. at a parking spot. And so it, it took <laughs> literally three or four tries to fully explain our, our situation that uh, indeed uh, we sailed all the way up there. And, uh, you know, we, we were- in a different category and wanted to contribute and wanted to make sure that those facilities can keep maintained with, with some of our contributions. So, um, so it was, it was kind of funny to try to explain it. Um, the, uh, the other thing to, to keep in mind on the Snake River is, as you can see from some of these pictures, the, the, the cliffs, they run all the way in. I mean, the depths in some of these areas are over hundred feet and those depths go pretty near the shore. Uh, so if you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to go and pick a place for anchoring, not a whole lot of places there. I mean, there is a couple. Um, they have uh, these habitat management areas uh, where people might go hunting or things like that that might have a dock. And depending on the draft and depending on the conditions, you might be able to kind of snug up to the dock there. Um, but, uh, but it does require a little bit of planning as far as, okay, what's our next stop? We're not just going to leave and think we're going to stop somewhere. Um, so that gets us all the way up to the furthest port inland in North America, which is Lewiston, Idaho. Um, appropriately, the, the two sides, two, two towns across the river from each other are called Lewiston and Clarkston. And um, the, probably the biggest place there is, uh, is called the Hell's Canyon Resort as far as uh, if you're arriving by water. Um, it was a challenge to navigate in because this particular resort, they haven't done a very good job of, uh, of dredging. Uh, and uh, when we called up again, it was just, uh, we're like, hey, we talked to you like a month ago about having some guest docs. Um, you know, where would you like us to go? And it was just, you could tell that there was this confusion about um, understanding that we're on a 37 foot sailboat, that we've got a draft, that we're unfamiliar with the area. Um, and uh, they're like, well, just tie up on the outside where, you know, where the boats drop off the ramp. And we're like, no, we're wanting to stay for several days. Like we actually want a guest dock rather than, you know, a two hour stop somewhere. So uh, not the most maintained place, uh, but really once we got in, it was, uh, it was quite nice. I mean, we had shore power, we had water, um, we had people welcoming us uh, there, as, as we called it, the welcoming committee is the, the, the moment we pulled up uh, to the docks. Yeah, the welcoming committee, um, a guy that lives on one of the sailboats there um, saw us coming in and he got off his boat, ran all the way around the marina, came all the way around to where we were going to be tying up, you know, wanted to grab the line so badly. And as soon as he got a hold of the line, he just looked at me and he's like, oh my God, you're the first visitors we've had all year. Mind you, this is September. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we got to know Jerry. He was a very good guy, but he was our personal concierge to that marina. Every time I got off the boat, even to like just go do laundry or throw away trash, he would come running around. Do you need something? Do you want my car? Is there anything? Um, and we later learned that they only had one visiting boat the year prior. 
and that we were the only one in 2021 that had made the trip all the way upstream. So he was very enthusiastic and very excited to, um, to host us there. Um, but what we did find was an alternative. Um, as much as the Hell's Canyon Resort was lovely, um, we also um, found this public dock that is located more around by the city. Um, and this particular dock was located right by a restaurant called Roosters. Um, apparently, the restaurant was the one that put it there because they knew that the Hell's Canyon Resort, the docks were getting kind of wonky and they wanted to get more traffic. So we ended up hanging out there at the Roosters dock for several of those nights. Um, it was a walk to the local Costco, which was, of course, super convenient because we hadn't um, been able to do any shopping in many weeks. And it was also right there by the local wineries and breweries and all of those kinds of things. So we took five days um, total there in Clarkston to regroup, explore, reprovision. And we ended up meeting one other boat of cruisers. It was a um, Nordhaven, Nordhaven, 40. A Nordhaven 40 um, that actually um, we just saw tied up to the dock there. And we just ran over and went and said hello to them and ended up um, hopping back down with them. So one sailboat and one motorboat made it upstream that year. Yeah. Well, um, wouldn't be a trip. I mean, the whole idea was to get to Idaho. So all of the pictures in Hell's Canyon and the public dock is, uh, is uh, over at Clarkston, Washington. So we needed to have uh, the bottom of our boat touch uh, Idaho waters. So we did it, uh, what we call the day trip to Idaho. Um, it's a... Uh, Again, very interconnected. This is where the Blue Bridge is that Adrian was talk, talking about, where um, I think uh, closed, it's only like 14 feet clearance, and then even fully open, it's only 42. So that that was definitely the end of the road for us. Uh, but there is a, again, at, at a park, kind of a public dock, you know, our boat is 37 feet. You can see there is not a whole lot of extra. So this is maybe 40, 45 foot dock. Um, we didn't feel particularly thrilled about uh, staying here overnight. So it was a, just a day trip that we were able to come in, tie up, go walk around Lewiston, um, enjoy the city and uh, much of it's uh, what it has to offer. Again, Native American history, kind of Native American focus. This is canoes kind of shaped. Uh, these are uh, aluminum canoes shaped into, into a wave. Uh, so just a lot of Lewis and Clark obviously focused, but also very much uh, around kind of the Native American art. So we were super curious what happened after the Blue Bridge. So we ended up um, getting onto a um, jet boat to go on up the Snake River further and explore Hell's Canyon. And we got to learn a lot from that. Um, Hell's Canyon is actually North America's deepest river gorge. It is 7,993 feet, and it is deeper than the Grand Canyon. We had no idea. Um, so that's why we needed to take a boat and go check it out. Um, it was definitely narrow. It was definitely shallow waters, um, but there was just a beautiful canyon up there and um, definitely worth just taking a day just to see what happened to the snake when you got beyond where our boat could take us. And, and these boats that they, uh, that they use for these stores are uh, shallow draft jet boats that have, a, 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 I think it's just one engine, but it's a, it's a giant like a V8 uh, Chevy engine that they put in the back of the boat and uh, they can skim kind of on top of, uh, on top of the boat. It almost acts like a, like a, jet, like a giant jet ski. Uh, because some of the, not just shallowness, but I mean, the steepness of the river and the, and the currents there, uh, those can get, get get pretty tough there. But the scenery is absolutely worth it. Uh, we had a fabulous day going up on the, on the day trip and just exploring uh, what the Upper Snake has to offer. So... No sailing trip would be complete without upgrades, failures, and repairs. So we did want to make sure that we um, discussed a little bit about the stuff that was necessary to be done on this particular trip. One thing to note is when you go upstream of Portland, there are zero boatyards. So yeah. whatever you need done, there's a couple in Portland. There's quite a few further downstream. There's one in Iwaco, which is right there at the Columbia River Bar. But anything that you need to get done, if you don't get it done in Portland, then that's your last boatyard opportunity. 
to 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 haul out. I mean, I'm sure you could find some local help, but you in find terms parts. of yeah, you could find parts maybe. Yeah. In 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 terms of because uh, there's a lot of fishing boats, a lot of recreational. So there's there's stores, but there's just not going to be a particular like a facility. Uh, where you can haul out or um, do any kind of, you know, find a rigger or something like that. Portland's going to be your last stop for that. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenges, I mean, we obviously over the last three years, we've done uh, a lot of work on our boat. A um, little bit different from blue water cruising in terms of, and actually you could see the rudder on somebody who asked at the beginning kind of what, the, what our rudder setup is. Um, and if anybody wants particular pictures or things like that, I saw somebody was asking us about solar panels or things like that. I kind of geek out on all of this. So uh, if you want to communicate, um, shoot us an email or uh, click on the contact through the website and we'll definitely get back to you. Um, but over the last couple, three years, we've replaced just about every system, everything from a chart plotter uh, to um, transducers to the radar, put on AIS. Uh, all the riggings, we put in sonar, we put in a NEMA 2000 network and all the associated electronics. Um, yeah, this was uh, not OSHA approved assistance in mounting the radar and AIS on our uh, radar post at the, at the, uh, at the yard. Uh, very cool places, a lot, of, a lot of there that people that actually know what they're, what they're doing and uh, willing to kind of give you an opportunity to work on your own on one hand, but also uh, be able to assist. Um, as I said in the beginning, we've got uh, a good AGM bank that uh, I managed to kind of rewire and add a separate starter battery just so that uh, we increased a little bit of our capacity uh, prior to this trip. Um, put in a shunt just so we can measure things a little bit better and understand. And um, uh, the, the, the good news going back to our trusted crew here. Uh, no matter what the project is, uh, supervision is always uh, necessary. Apparently, I can't be trusted with a screwdriver or, uh, or power tools. So she's always uh, trying to understand exactly why the whole place is uh, being torn upside down. Um, this is a picture. Uh, as you go upstream, there are places where the, the seaweeds can get uh, very prominent. They do uh, pull them out and try to manage them depending on the area. Uh, but th the reason why I put this picture in here is uh, just understand your boat. Again, once you get past Portland, you're kind of on your own. So knowing, knowing how to replace or how to check your raw water intake for engine cooling, making sure that you don't have it clogged up with the weeds, um, just certain basic things, understanding of how that works, the, the self-sufficiency uh, really ensures that, you know, you can have a successful trip. Um, on the way down, it started to get nice and chilly. And uh, this is me in the cockpit locker because that's where our diesel heater is mounted. And you can see the score on my face because it's been working pretty well for the last couple of years. And uh, just when temperatures started dropping into the 30s and my lovely uh, captain is, uh, is complaining that it's getting really chilly in the mornings, um, the, the, the heater decided to stop and working. So uh, with the appropriate supervision and uh, pulling it out and everything else, I was able to uh, disassemble it and uh, test it out. We kind of quote unquote bench tested it. Uh, that's a little plastic bottle with uh, diesel fuel in it. Um, again, not OSHA approved, but uh, we needed to kind of debug everything that was going on. In this particular case, heater and everything was working fine, but uh, from the previous owner, or I think over the years, the exhaust wasn't allowing, uh, there was some carbon buildup in the exhaust for those of you that are curious. And so once we kind of flushed that out and cleaned it out and brushed it out, uh, heater kicked in and uh, we were nice and toasty all over again. So time for just kind of wrapping it up and some reflections on uh, on our trip of uh, what we enjoyed, what we, what we found most surprising, et cetera. Yeah, so we get asked all the time some of these kinds of questions. Well, what was most surprising? What was the scariest? What was most peaceful? So we decided just to throw a couple of those at you just to wrap up. Um, I would say most surprising is how few people do this trip. Um, upstream of Hood River, there were really no recreational, well, maybe at the Dalles. We met the one guy on the trimaran there at the Dalles. But fewer and fewer the further you got up. And when you even got halfway up the Columbia River, um, it was just desolate. 
the trains, they would always um, toot their horns at us because we'd be the only boats for like hours, you know, along the river of going by. And we would go entire days without seeing another boat. So we always found it really great when the trains would go by, they would like toot at us and get our attention. We yeah, had a we, couple we, people. We'd grab our air horn and, and go back at them because it was just kind of a mutual acknowledgement. It's kind of like what it must feel like on a really long passage through the Pacific. If you ever see another boat, it's kind of just like, oh my gosh, another human being. So in, in a lot of ways, that's how it felt for us at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, people ask us what was the scary thing. I would say the Dallas uh, and going through the lock. Uh, that was, you know, on us in terms of a ensuring that we've got all the fenders and you know proper leverage on the lines. They were properly communicating. So again, the locks on their own, not that scary. We just happened to have a scary experience, and uh, that's definitely something we will remember. And uh, as as we like to say, it was a it was definitely a, a very strong learning lesson. Yeah, and I would say the, the lesson we learned about how to tie the lines actually solved that. So I do not feel like that will ever be a scary moment again, um, but it definitely taught us the importance of getting those um, mooring lines tied properly. Uh, the most peaceful had to be New York Island. It was just such an amazing frolicking. We used the word frolicking when we were talking about how we just kept jumping in the water and playing and there was no one, I think for two days straight, we stayed there, no one coming by. Um, and it was just our little private, peaceful. And then the most stunning was the basalt cliffs. When you get up to the um, far upstream of the Snake River, you just get these cliffs going down both sides of the river. And it's just amazing formations. And you feel like you're just going through the middle of the Grand Canyon. It's just hard to even capture in a photograph. Yeah, and um, this is actually picture down from uh, Cape Horn where I had the video of the waves coming through. Again, cliffs coming down all the way to the edge. If you're driving by on the Washington side of the river, you can actually stop here and kind of over uh, look over the, the river. Um, but really the most inspiring uh, when people say, you know, what was most inspiring about this is how many backyard opportunities are in your backyard? You know, where can you go for uh, a weekend, for an overnight um, for a couple, three weeks, whatever, whatever you have available, whatever boat you have, whatever area you're in, you know, where can you go that you can explore in your backyard? You know, everybody talks about circumnavigating or crossing the Pacific or things like that, which trust me, we aspire towards that as well. Uh, but in the meantime, there's just so much local area to explore, um, that, uh, we hope we encourage and we inspire you to try some of the same. And, uh, that's kind of wraps up the formal part or the, the presentation, the slides. Of course, I know the chat has been blowing up and Adrian has been uh, answering some of the questions. But again, before we get into more of the interaction and answering some of the questions uh, as you have them, thank you so much for uh, letting us share this. And we genuinely hope that we inspired you and encouraged you to go and explore your backyard in your own area. The website's there, feel free to check it out. Free, feel free to drop us a note. Uh, we're gonna be adding a lot more content to, uh, to the website, to the guides, so that if you do venture out there, um, you, can, you can find it for yourself. Yay. That was really great, you two. Thank oh, you thank so you. much for sharing that. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, there were, as you said, a number of um, questions in the chat box uh, that Adrian has gone and answered. <laughs> uh, so, um, Margie, yeah. raised hand. Yeah. Uh, did you have a dinghy by any chance? I'm not sure I saw one in the photos. Yeah, good question. Uh, so we do have a, a dinghy. It's one of the folding porta boats. And uh, in all honestly, we never uh, got a chance. I mean, there was probably chances to get it unpacked and use it, uh, but you can do all of this trip uh, without really having any particular need for a dinghy. So, uh, no, you know, certainly useful to have, but not required. Yeah, and our dinghy takes a little bit of work to set it up. So we just kind of were like, eh, we're good. Yeah, I can understand that. 
<laughs> um, yeah, okay, so we had some other questions about you know, how far up river might you get with say a 65 foot air draft? You know, uh, you can get, uh, I, I believe, uh, you can get all the way up to Kennewick. Uh, Kennewick is going to be your limiting factor, the, uh, the bridges in Kennewick itself. But like all the way up, if you look at the map uh, where the, the Columbia River kind of turns all the way north and goes into Kennewick, and you can pretty much get to, uh, to the Snake River. Uh, there is a beautiful park, Sacagawea Park, at the, at the edge. So you could overnight there at the docks. You just won't be able to get further upstream on the snake or uh, go into Kennewick. Uh, there might be other places to tie up or anchor overnight close to it. And that's where a dinghy would be really helpful because then you can go into uh, Kennewick or Richland and reprovision. Uh, but uh, I believe with a 65 foot draft, air draft, uh, you, could, you could go all the way up to Columbia, almost the entire navigable length of it. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And if, if you were to go downtown Portland, again, a lot of bridges, um, we're going to put the links on the website as far as, you know, what all the heights are, when they open, some of them because of the traffic, morning, evening, rush hour, they don't open until a certain hour. Um, but uh, there are a couple of bridges there that you have to call like 24 hours in advance and, and advise them that you're going to be transiting. But again, I think with a 65 foot draft, you should be able to get uh, to downtown Portland and pretty much the, the vast majority of the navigable portion of the Columbia River. So a couple people are asking in the chat about crossing the bar. We actually, we bought the boat in Portland. So we went out almost to get to cross the bar outbound and ended up stopping in Owaco and then came back upstream, uh, back upstream. So we have not yet crossed the bar. However, we have been listening to all of the radio chatter about it. And it seems like there are days when all of the Coast Guards are basically saying it's no big deal and it's fine. And then there are days when they're saying there's Coast Guard warning, don't go. So from what we've gathered, it's really just literally a matter of listening to the Coast Guard warnings. They have a Coast Guard station right there. And there are days when they say the bar is clear, the bar is open, feel free. I mean, that's literally what they're saying on the radio. So we're not too worried about it as long as we can find one of those days when the Coast Guard is reporting it in that condition. Yeah, there was a couple of questions in the chat that I saw there about, um, well, did we raise a, our swing keel um, on the lower Columbia where the sloughs are or, or things like that? Uh, it definitely has come in handy. Again, not required um, on the upper Columbia and snake. We, we had to raise it to get into Clarkston, didn't we? Uh, to, to the to the Hell's Canyon Resort, Hell's yeah, we had to resort. because they weren't dredged, <laughs> so that was more kind of a precaution on our end, um, and that was a, also a reminder for me that when the keel is lifted, the boat handles very differently and, and you know has a lot of uh, sideways motion uh, when you try to to maneuver. But uh, but again, I I, I don't think uh, you know even if we had an eight foot draft boat or something like that, I don't think I would be afraid to make this trip. Um, there was also another question about motoring. Um, we had the stats up front, uh, I would say on the upstream, about two thirds of the time we were sailing um, because of the prevailing winds out of the West. Uh, a lot of the motoring happened uh, on the, you know, I mean, you've got six knots of current. As a matter of fact, well, I, I was gonna say you have six, six uh, knots of current under Bonneville Dam, but we've actually sailed all the way up to Bonneville Dam before when the winds were, uh, you know, 15, 20, and, and they, they were able to push us into the current um, actually better and more efficiently than, than the motor would. Um, so yeah, you do have to account for some of that. And then on the downstream, there, for our particular case, there was a little bit more motoring, but also because the, the current's with you, it actually kind of uh, uh, skews the numbers a little bit as far as sailing versus motoring, because once you turn on the motor, you just tend to go just a little bit faster. So when you're going downstream, you know, you're approaching all these dams and locks with the current behind you. Um, was that a, a particularly different challenge than when you were coming into them going upstream? No, you know, they not, probably don't not look really. like the canyons they, that they become. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, you're just tying up to like a seawall that's, uh, you know, maybe six or eight feet high. So it's not nearly as intimidating 
Um, there, there were some instances where uh, the crosswind was, was affecting the maneuverability. Uh, but, uh, but coming downstream, because again, you're at the, what, what I would say that the downstream side of the lake, right? That's where the dam is. So your depth is well over hundred feet. So as far as current goes uh, on, the, on the upstream side entering the lock, there is no, no effect from the current. Uh, you just got to manage the wind and, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's, it's a no big deal because we paid very close attention. Uh, but uh, once we had all the fenders out, the lines prepared, uh, got up to the bit, I don't think we had any challenges, Adrian, yeah. with, uh, with the downstream. Yeah, well, and we're also, we're also letting the lock masters know like an hour in advance before our approach. So they've got the gates open, they've already got it filled. So you're actually coming into pretty still water because they're preparing the lock for you before you approach. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Bruce uh, asked if there are any pump outs. Absolutely. Uh, both Oregon and Washington are very keen on providing these free pump outs. As a matter of fact, most marinas uh, nowadays have to have a, uh, a like an official pump out. Most of the fuel docks have a pump out. Um, there is a couple of websites. Again, I'll, I'll put the links to the uh, to, on our website, but uh, or if you want to just email me, I'll send you the resources that I have. Um, but there is also a couple of apps that uh, apparently work even in the Pacific Northwest, where you can just pull up a map and it'll you know obviously put a dot where you are, but it'll show you the facilities where you can pump out uh, near you. So uh, yeah. up and down Columbia, Snake, Willamette Rivers uh, takes a little bit of timing, and especially if you're going off season when we've been up to Hood River in the winter time. Uh, the pump out because of the freezing temperatures, they may have it closed or the, the water tap might be turned off uh, for the winter time and not uh, not have it turned on. So it takes a little bit of planning, but uh, but I don't I don't yeah. think. I well, don't but on like the snake, there were, on the snake, there were only two. There was Lions Ferry and then there was mm -hmm. Warrior Park. There was nothing else on the snake. And we actually never found a pump out in Clarkston or Lewiston even that was accessible for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there you was, just have to time it. You have to know where they are and time it. Yeah, there was one at the Hell's Canyon Resort officially, but uh, but because of their and they did advise us, they're like, hey, we haven't been dredged in a while, so uh, officially there it was, was a pump way out there, along the we, shoreline. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, even we didn't try approach it. it. Um, there's a question about uh, cost going through the lock. No, there's thank you very much here for to the U.S. taxpayers. Uh, all all of the dams that we transited are operated by the. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so mm -hmm. you can go through as many times as you want. The only thing that the lock masters will prevent you from doing, because apparently some people have tried, that's why we can't have nice things, is they come in, they go one way in the lock, and then when they're, let's say they go up, they go, okay, we're done, you know, let's go down, take us down. They won't let you do that. Uh, they, they, they're like, okay, this is not a, this is not a Disney it's not ride. A ride, yeah. Well, and actually we never locked through two locks on the same day. We, True. we always timed it so that we never tried to do two locks on the same day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Randy, you, you asked about how well is the area charted? Uh, I would say extremely well. Uh, the lower sloughs, you know, once you get outside, I, I guess it depends, maybe is a better answer. Uh, the main channel and the shipping areas and all that extremely well charted. I'm going to put an asterisk there because we have been witness to a ocean going ship uh, touching bottom uh, and getting stuck for about 24, 36 hours. Uh, it was just below Longview. Um, and they were they were still officially according to the charts, according to the buoys, everything. They were still within the channel, uh, but it's just it can change pretty dramatically. Even on the Snake River, you can be two boat widths outside of the channel, and instead of thirty feet, you might have eight. Um, so uh, so so from that perspective, you know there, there are areas that you need to be careful. But on the other hand, it is well charted. Like I said, we used both open CPN more kind of for planning purposes and everything else and just kind of a different way of looking at the charts. Uh, we've got our BNG chart plotter. And then on the on the phone, um, we found there is an app called CIQ. Uh, that's S-E-A-I-Q. Um, that's actually used by apparently a lot of the commercial captains. Uh, and you can download uh, the, the app itself. You can use it for free. Some things are disabled. And then I think you pay like $5, um, but it's a full blown chart plotter with any U.S. Coast Guard charts that you can just download into it for free. Um, and uh, we found it very 
helpful to have that kind of as a backup on our on our uh, mobile devices. Well, and you actually fed the AIS data into our CIQ as well. Yeah. So it's actually, it's capable of tying in your different systems so that they're all showing up within the CIQ. Yeah. And that's, uh, Roger, that's, a, that's your plug for a Raspberry Pi because we run the open plotter. So we do have a Raspberry Pi on the boat and that's kind of what ties all of our network and crosses between, we've got a couple of devices that are still NEMA 183 versus NEMA 2000, uh, getting it on our Wi-Fi and our uh, local devices, all of that data. So uh, it's, it's a great system just to kind of put it together and have everything available on all the devices. Um, is diesel widely available? Um, question from Marianne and Larry. Um, diesel is widely available until you get to the Snake River. Then when you're on the Snake River, it's only gas, uh, but Kennewick has a, a very good and very frequently used diesel dock. Um, but once you get up onto the Snake River, supposedly I, I uh, did research it because that was certainly a concern that if we had, uh, uh, unfavorable winds that we'd need to refuel up in Idaho. Um, so supposedly there's like a commercial dock where you can tie up and they will let you buy diesel in Idaho. Uh, but we found no need to do that. We topped off in Kennewick just to be sure because we didn't know what to expect in uh, what to expect on the Snake River. Um, there was, like I said, at Lions Ferry and Boyer Park, they had, uh, they had regular gas, but no diesel. Um, so I would just plan for that, but again, I would not, unless you're on a, on a large motorboat, but again, if you're on a large motorboat with a big consumption, then your tank is, uh, bigger than, uh, than most sailboats anyway. So, uh, so I, I wouldn't consider that a limiting factor. All right. I don't know if I missed any other questions, uh, Heather, Adrian, I'm oh, sure you're scrolling Roger. through it as well. Yeah. Roger just asked, um, in general, how well does the TV antenna uh, Shakespeare work above the radar or yeah. how do you use that? Short answer, we have no idea because that was put on there by the prior owners and and I probably is the first thing we took off the boat was the TV that was mounted <laughs> on the bulkhead. Um, for us, uh, you know, we're both kind of in technology and just work on computers and presentations and webinars and uh, running a virtual company, etc. So we spent so much time in front of a screen that watching TV while we're aboard uh, was the first thing that we nixed. So unfortunately, I can't tell you. Now, the prior owners were very good friends with them and in touch with them. And from what we understand, uh, that they they loved it. They they had it uh, they had it on the boat. It worked really well for them. And the the radar that used to be the Raymarine radar was from like 20, 30 years ago on the boat. Uh, didn't seem to give it uh, any kind of interference. So they, they seem to enjoy it and like it. Okay. And yeah, since we've taken that down anyway, we, um, we took down the TIVA antenna and we put the new radar and we have an AIS antenna back there now. Yep. Wish would, I, I wish I would have known, Roger, that you're interested in it because I would have uh, happily shipped it over to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we've had the, a Admi the Admiral did make an appearance, by the way. Oh, yes. Uh. <laughs> Very cute. Uh, and yeah, you, we've had a couple of, uh, of comments. I'm just going to read them out uh, that, you know, Isabel Bliss says that it was an absolutely fascinating presentation and she admitted she was puzzled at first, like, why weren't you going out to sea? Uh, going the wrong way inland, but you made a very compelling case for doing that kind of a journey. And it reminded her of narrow boating along England's canals and experiencing a variety of countryside and towns. Uh, and, uh, and Marianne and Larry have written that they've been considering that kind of a voyage for quite some time as it would take them close to uh, one of their birthplaces, and perhaps now after thinking about it for 20 years, they'll actually try it. So you have inspired some people. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And like I said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're, we, we, we like to think of ourselves as very approachable. I, I am not going to pretend like we have the ultimate guide or ultimate uh, resources. We just know from what we've seen but because there, is, there was so little available to cruisers or you know people that just wanna 
not just fish or go out for, for a day on a ski boat. Uh, that's why we started compiling all that information and, and uh, making it available. So we're, we're happy to pass yeah. that along. Well, and I'm going to answer Mark Evans and um, Denise's question because that's actually a perfect segue to um, the person who said something about going the wrong way. Um, the question is, where are you off to next? And as we said, we bought the boat in Portland um, and it's our first kill boat. And the only reason we bought it in Portland, we had no particular connection. It's just, it was the only one of that model and that's the boat we wanted. And that just happened to be where it was. So we knew that once we go out the Columbia River Bar, we're probably not gonna go back. It's not like it's a home base to us. It's just where the boat happened to be. And we are planning hopefully this summer, if all of the stars align, um, we are planning on moving her up to the Puget Sound area and then heading up north towards you guys. Um, but um, in the meantime, we decided, you know, before we leave the Columbia River, we ought to just see what happens if we go all the way upstream. Um, because we did know that we probably wouldn't come back um, into the Columbia River once we go. There's a whole world to explore. So, like I said, if all of the um, stars align and things work out timing wise for us, hopefully we will be heading out the Columbia River Bar and headed up north this summer and uh, maybe come visit you guys up in Vancouver. It would be great to have you come visit us. <laughs> and, 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 and if the timing doesn't work out, frankly, I, I think if I speak for both of us, we'd be thrilled to do this uh, upstream trip all over again now, having learned some of the lessons, just kind of to re-explore the same areas and be a little bit calmer about what the next stop looks like. Because as you, as you know, when you go to, to places that don't have a lot of information and, and no, no guide, no nothing, um, there is just always that anxiety about like, is that marina really there? Is there, um, you know, is the entrance, is there a dock? Is there, what are the conditions like? And now because we know so much more, I think we just have a different experience with it. So um, it was, it was so enjoyable that if, uh, if, we, if we decided to do it again, I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't see that as a slight. Wonderful. Uh, Bill, to your answer awesome. on our Southerly uh, 115, it's a British made boat, but it's wired for 110. Okay. I think that might've been rewired by the prior owners or adjusted uh, the, the boat. Like I said, we bought it three years ago. So uh, it was for almost 30 years. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was in a single owner boat before. So, and they, mm -hmm. um, we'll, we, we have a link to it on our website. Just uh, if, if you're curious about the, that particular boat, uh, the prior owners based out of Portland, they took it out the West Coast, out, out the bar, down the West Coast, all the way down to Panama Canal, across Panama Canal, and up through the Caribbean and Eastern seaboard. Uh, they lived aboard for four years while they made that trip. So uh, we know the boat can handle way more than than the current crew. Uh, but uh, but there is they actually went ahead and wrote a couple of books about their adventures. So it's kind of a mixture of destination and uh, some of the channel, you know, obviously not maybe not obviously, but he is uh, the prior owner. He was a little bit more technically minded so that you get a lot of perspective about how the boat performs and what are some of the upgrades. And then uh, Kay, uh, the lady, uh, she was more about the destination and the people and everything else and sharing a lot of that. So there's two books written with, uh, with our boat um, that we now oh, wow. are the proud uh, caretakers of. I put the name of the book and the author in the um, chat. Yeah, that's, that's really great. It's wonderful to have a boat with a lot of history. Yeah. Uh, you definitely have that. It's yeah, fun to yeah. read the book because they'll be talking about, oh, this one leak that we never found the source of. And I'll be reading it going, oh, my God, they knew about that leak. <laughs> <laughs> we still have that same leak. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they've been wonderful mentors to us because awesome. uh, they, they kind of, in their own words, they aged out of the, of the hobby and uh, they, they struggled for a long time to let go of the boat. And uh, we, we really try to include them and involve them in kind of the, the next chapter of, of the boat's uh, adventures, so. Mm. Yeah, that's great. All right. All right. Well, um, in that case, you know, 
thank you so much on behalf of BCA and myself personally. Thank you so much for sharing this journey with us. Uh, you know, I'm sure that exploring inland from Portland hadn't been on too many people's radar so far, but like I said, every year there's some who head south and uh, and they may be, some of those may be inspired to make a stop along the way to explore uh, quite a bit farther inland. And, and we've, had our, we've had our expression of interest from Marianne and Larry, who have quite a bit of experience in other parts of the world. But um, yeah, so no, as thank you, thank you very, very much. And as most here know, BCA offers a small honorarium to the speakers to, um, to um, express our appreciation of the time and the effort that goes into making presentations. And Adrian and Peter have requested that we donate their honorarium to their yacht club, the Sovi Island Yacht Club, which has been hugely supportive of their own learning. Uh, and uh, so we will be doing so. And once again, on behalf of BCA, thank you for this really great and inspiring presentation. Thank you all. Yes, wonderful, thank you guys so much. And wonderful it, it, it was great, great. We, we look forward to getting to know you guys. Thank you so much for having us. And Come up and see us. We uh, yes, hopefully we will be able to see you in person at some point. Uh, uh, we'd love it. Yeah.